on glued to a movie tv show characters your heroes what messages are tv movies and music giving your children is media influencing our children to act a certain way drink alcohol have sex earlier and what can we do about it the answer for parents is a lot coming up next on iq smart parent what you as a parent want to tune in and tune out in movies music and tv Samaro. Some of you may know me as the creator of Super Y, Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, and Blue's Clues, but I'm also a mom of two great girls. I create shows that I want to be big hits with kids, but I also want them to teach things from core curriculum skills to reading to life lessons. My work has been all about kids, but the secret of my shows is that there are messages in there to help parents. So I'm thrilled to host this episode of IQ Smart Parent. Take a look at these statistics. By the age of 18, we know that most children will have seen 200,000 acts of violence, that most movies and TV shows contain sexual content, and that almost all PG-13 movies include alcohol. Wow, 30 acts of violence a day for every child in America is what 200,000 acts is. Media is in our lives and our children's lives to stay, and it's just growing. So here's the big question we want to answer today. Do we know enough about how influential media is? And how about our teens? Ready for this? Does watching sex in movies and TV make them have sex earlier? Here to help us learn more about how the media influences our children's behavior is Steven Martino, a behavioral scientist at the RAND Corporation. Hi, Steven. Hi, Angela. So you and I, we both have kids around the same age. I have girls, you have boys, and this statistic on sex is freaking me out a little bit. Well, it should. I mean, the research <laughs> is very clear on this topic. We know that the more sexual content that kids see on TV, the earlier they initiate sexual activity and the more likely they are to regret their early sexual experiences and also the more likely they are to have an unplanned teen pregnancy. So it's, it, it should worry you. And what, <laughs> it does. <laughs> <laughs> what, what kind of sex are we talking about? Is it like soap opera sex that we have to worry about or is it just talking about sex on like an eight o'clock prime time mm -hmm. show? Well, it's, it's, it's both of those things. It's, uh, in, in the research that we did at the RAND Corporation, we made sure to analyze the content of television shows for both talk about sex, and that could be anything from uh, discussions about sex that, that has already occurred or sex that uh, people wish could, could or would happen, uh, to sexual behaviors, things from all the way from passionate kissing uh, to, to actual depictions of sexual intercourse on TV, which happen more frequently than, than some of our audience might imagine. Now, I know I'm really concerned about all the violence that, that our children are watching on television. Is it a similar type of, of thing in terms of the research that we know about violence and our kids and, and sex? Absolutely. One, one of the surest things uh, in, in the social science literature is that there is a strong causal connection between kids exposure to violence in the media and their later violent and aggressive behavior and their violent and aggressive thoughts. Oh. And so what I'm hearing is that for our preschool shows, what we really try to do is think about the behavior and the modeling. So we don't, for preschool, pre preschoolers, it's like don't have them stand on a chair, mm -hmm. don't have them run around with scissors. So it's kind of the same thing in terms of seeing characters on TV shows that might be drinking alcohol right. or smoking or being violent. Their right. kids think it's permissible. Yes. and. Uh, you know, alcohol use on, on television, in movies, uh, is, is, is everywhere. 90% uh, of movies depict some sort of alcohol use. And, and commercials. And commercials. Uh, kids are exposed to nearly 300 commercials a year for alcohol. 
Um, and, and you need to worry about what, what message does that send. Uh, a, a constant barrage of commercials about alcohol, constant alcohol use in, in movies. PG-13 movies have just as much alcohol use in them as R-rated movies. And so you need to wonder what message is that sending to children? What messages are they taking from that? And today, kids are not just watching TV. They're also using all these social media devices. So has that escalated the risk for us? Well, we think so. Um, the research is not as clear on that issue because there's not as much research that's been done because it is new media. Um, but we think that because uh, social networking sites, uh, sites like YouTube, because they marry both the mass media with its far reach and uh, interpersonal influence, peer influence. That so all that commentary, so if you're watching a video, you're also hearing from all of these other people that you think are your peers saying right. things. That's right. So your, your child, when they go on YouTube to see a video, is not just getting to see the video with all of its perhaps questionable, questionable content. They're also getting to see the commentary that appears below the video. And a that lot of that is... That happened with your son, right? That's, that did. That happened to, uh, to my son. We went to uh, a, a YouTube site, uh, the YouTube site, to see uh, something that we thought was, was very simple. was. Uh, uh, one of his favorite soccer players. We wanted to see a, a video of all, of all his exploits on the soccer field. And instead, what we saw underneath the, uh, the video were some comments, uh, of some homophobic comments, basically. Um, and, 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 and there they were. And this is a 10-year-old boy I'm talking about. And, and so my first reaction was, let's shut this down. What, you know, what, what can I do? And what did you do? Well, we, I, he, I think, sensed my discomfort, and so I felt like I needed to have a conversation with him about that. Um, and, and it sparked a very healthy conversation. And if you would have shut that computer down, it would have had a whole different meaning to him, I would think. Perhaps. I mean, there, there's a lot to be read from what's not said, from, right. the, from your, right. from your dis discomfort, from your body language. Right. right. And smoking, the research on smoking is also just as bad in terms of how we're equating our characters when they're smoking and mm -hmm. what our kids are thinking about that. That's right. We, we know that uh, smoking in movies is, is just as prevalent as alcohol use, and we know that uh, when people when writers are writing characters, they, they often use props like cigarettes to create certain traits, certain feeling of the character. And when, when kids are watching these depictions, they understand that it's the rebellious kid or person who mm -hmm. smokes. It's the person who is anxious and needs to calm down who smokes. It's the person who is in a social situation. And they pick up on all of these messages or motives for smoking they and they start to associate that. the mm -hmm. things. Oh, it's so scary. And music, too. Tell me about music lyrics versus music videos. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know that we can bop along to a Katy Perry song right. and then all of a sudden realize what the kids are singing about. Right. I mean, it's, it, they're, they're very infectious songs. They're <laughs> very fun to listen to. Katy Perry, uh, a couple of years ago, had a very popular song, California Girls. Um, a, very, a very fun song to listen to, but the messages, messages in that song are, are not necessarily healthy ones. If there's any sort of ambiguity about what she's she's singing about, um, you need to you, you need to go onto YouTube mm. and see the video, and and all that ambiguity it goes away. So what do we do? Turn you know what what do we do with for our kids? Well, certainly, um, for especially for your young adolescents, you're going to want to restrict how much media they see, how how often they can. Uh, sit in front of the television, how much access they have to the internet. Um, and it's because we want them to delay all of these things, right? We want them to wait as long as possible. That's right. We'd like to uh, keep them from being exposed to, to some of these things that we know are harmful. Okay. But the problem is that it's very hard to keep kids from being exposed to these things, uh, especially older teens who have smartphones, mm -hmm. uh, have easy access to the internet all the time who have friends who have access to these things as well, um, you're not going to be able to keep them from seeing these things. Right. So you should start having conversations right. with them very early on. Right. And there are a lot of good resources for topics of conversation on websites like Common Sense Media. Mm -hmm. They provide yep. fantastic analysis of all of the shows and music that's yep. out there and suggest topics for conversation. Yep. And your own values, right? We really need to think about. That's right, because the media is, is communicating a value yes. that's not necessarily your own family's value. Right. And so kids need to hear that. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm.
thank you so much for scaring us. But it's, <laughs> it's information we need. We need to know this. Okay, so here's, welcome. thank you. So here's what we know. Even very little kids spend three hours with media at home, and that number grows eventually to about 10 and three quarter hours a day. And that's mostly outside of school and mostly with more than one de device at a time. Our media diet is as important as our healthy foods diet. We have so many choices when it comes to media, and we need kids to like what they're watching, just like we want them to like what they're eating, but we need it to be good for them. So I wish we had a nutrition label on media, and it would look something like this. What's the quality of the media kids are watching? Is it organic, or are there some little chemicals and fillers in it that we don't want our kids to be seeing? What are the ingredients? Is it educational? Is it violent? What's the storyline? What's the problem? How does your child react to the media? Is it, are they allergic to it? I know when my girls start talking sassy talk after they watch a show, that's an allergic reaction in, in my mind. This whole um, recipe, this whole idea needs to be part of everyday health and wellness for today's kids. So here's my first of three Angela's clues. Clue number one, make an informed choice about the media you watch. Watch with them if you can, read the reviews, understand what the show is about. We are always, parents often look to other um, information about movie content, and one of the things is from the Motion Picture Association and the ratings. I know my kids were hoping we had PG, we had PG-13, they were discussing PG-14, PG-15, PG-16, and while I wish that that was true, it's not. But we're curious about how exactly we, those movies get those ratings. So let's take a look at this video about the ratings process. The film rating system is an independent system, self-funded by submission fees. Uh, our business comes from not only member companies of the MPAA, but uh, independent filmmakers as well. They pay a fee to get the rating. The rating is provided by a board of parents. They screen the film at the same time, fill out a, written, a brief written ballot, have a discussion, and then out of that discussion, uh, a rating and rating descriptor is offered to the submitter. If they agree with our rating but want to market it with a different rating, they can um, edit the film and submit it again and the whole process starts all over again with uh, the board screening it, uh, voting and discussing it. And there are some very accepted rating organizations out there for music, for TV, for movies and for apps. But my go-to resource as a parent, which gives me even more detailed information, is Common Sense Media. I've learned that it has over 19,000 different pieces of media that's rated for age appropriateness and has a scale for every aspect that we as parents need to know about. Is there sex in it? How much sex? Alcohol? How much alcohol? Violence? How scary is it? Is there merchandising in the, in the show? So it's clear that movies and other forms of media can have the strong influence on adolescent health and behavior. That's clear, it has an influence on us. But have you ever discussed this issue with your pediatrician? This is a definite health concern and that's why we have Dr. Debbie Gilboa here with us. As many of you may know, Dr. Gilboa is a family physician who helps deal with many challenges that parents face, including the media's effect on our kids. Dr. G, as a physician, what are you hearing from parents and what concerns you? Hi, Angela. What I hear most from parents is that they're really worried about what is it that their kids are getting and can they have any control over it? You know, it's really true that when we work with our kids about what they wanna watch, we often feel like we're in this constant struggle and battle uh, because kids push, which is their role, and we're wondering how do we push back in a way that's effective, in a way that, like Angela mentioned, kids can really enjoy what they're watching but not take in a lot of chemicals and fillers that we don't feel good about and that we think is gonna have a detrimental effect on their health. I'm really excited to be here tonight to talk to some of the parents in the audience about the experiences that you're having and some of the teens that we have here as well about what do you find are the challenges about your kid's media diet? You know, How do we get these values that we want our kids to have to ring louder in their heads than the value that they're hearing from the media. So, you know, I was talking to several of the parents beforehand, and I'm actually going to ask Shatan to come up now and talk with me for just a minute, because we were talking about exactly what Angela mentioned earlier, this idea of an allergic reaction to watching a show. 
So Shatan, you have a daughter who's almost three. Have you ever experienced that she's watched something and you've seen it influence her? Absolutely, we're really careful about what she consumes, but I've found that you know, watching shows is more addictive than potato chips. Mm -hmm. So like the more exposure that she gets to television, the more she wants. And so she was walking around a lot saying, ah, oh, man. And this is when she was only 18 months. And I was wondering, where does that come from? Boots from Dora the Explorer says, ah, oh, man, when he doesn't get what he wants. And so for that reason, I realized that she's just a little sponge. And so we have to be very careful about what we allow her to consume. Because it's entirely possible that she might soon hear something that was a little bit more strident than like, ah, man. Ah, something else. Right, exactly. <laughs> And when you hear her using that, it sounds like what you're saying is that it's a reminder to you that maybe she's reached her media limit for that day or that, that section of time. But do you also talk to her about it? Do you point out to her, hey, Boots says that. What do you say? Yeah, we do try to manage and create boundaries for her and to say, well, wait a second. You can't say that to mommy. Like, if I take something from her, she shouldn't be going around saying, "Ah, man, she should say, I'm sorry, mommy. And so balancing the attitude with the words is That's a That's a really important part, absolutely. Thank you very much. It is really an important challenge that we all have to find the balance for our kids between what it is that they really enjoy and, and the character traits they want to take on. You know, um, I saw on an episode of the PBS Parent Show the suggestion that we shouldn't let our kids get into heroes and characters that we wouldn't want to invite into our homes as friends of theirs. And I think that that's such good advice because they do take these characters and make them friends. You know, adults, we do this too. We watch a show that we really, really like and we start to feel like we know those characters, know what to expect from them. There are character traits we really like about them. And, and if we could sit down and have coffee with them, we really might, you know? Um, Robin, I'm going to ask you to come up for a minute because I want to talk about something that I think parents really struggle with, and that is those boundaries that Shatan mentioned. How do we enforce those, right? Especially when a lot of the media that our older kids, you and I have kids who are a little bit older than that. You have kids that are from 6 to 12. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you control those boundaries when they might be taking in media that you're not always around for? Well, I have had trouble and experience before with other parents and asserting my own values when my children are over at someone else's home. Um, I, it, it's a fine line because you don't want to embarrass your children um, <laughs> and prevent them from being part of the group and enjoying social experiences. It's, the social experience is really important. But it can be scary. I've had um, some of my younger children see PG-13 movies over at um, someone else's house, and I really was not comfortable with that. Um, that really makes a big difference, right? Do you know that of the top 10 movies this summer, almost all of them are PG-13, right? There are a couple that are PG. There are no G-rated movies in the top movies coming out this summer, and that makes it really cha challenging as parents. Do you find like the rating system is actually helpful to you? Actually, no. I had a, a, an awful experience where I very carefully chose a movie for my second grader to watch with another second grader after trick-or-treating. I looked on Amazon and it had really good ratings. It was a PG movie and I watched it with them and Great. there Co were a bunch really of important. cuss words in it and I had to call and apologize to the other parent. <laughs> and now you're the parent, right? And, <laughs> Who's like, uh, uh, you watched this right. at my house. <laughs> and so here I was so careful to like look at the reviews of this film and um, you know, it was really embarrassing to me and I felt terrible for exposing the children to this. And that's really a great point. Thank you so much. I think that it's, it's really valuable to remember that when we're talking to parents about what, you know, we're talking to other parents even about what we're gonna allow our kids to see when we're talking to our own children about what we're gonna let them see that we include them in the conversation about accountability too, right? That we don't just say, okay, tell me what you wanna watch and I'll say yes or no. That just like we've talked about on these, we've talked about on this show with nutrition labels and this lovely idea Angela has, could we have nutrition labels for our uh, media, is we read a label with our child that maybe we get on Common Sense Media with them and say, well, let's decide together. I'm, I'm the decision maker, but I'd like to hear what you think of this review, of this, of this thing that you wanna watch. What age do you think this is appropriate? And, uh, and one of the things that I've really found is helpful is I'll ask an older child if they would suggest a younger child, maybe two years younger, watch this. And holding them as helping me be an arbiter of what's appropriate for someone younger, they're often more restrictive than I would be when I'm talking about their younger siblings. We have a question that came in on Facebook. 
So much of what is on TV seems to promote physical intimacy between young teens. How can I talk to my kids about that? This is such a good question. You know, uh, Mr. Martino mentioned that he watched something with his son and he had this discomfort reaction and he wanted to shut it down right away, but really it sparked a very good conversation. So we don't have to look at every um, inappropriate thing that our kids might see in media as a failure as a parent. What matters is what we do next, is the conversation that we have with them about that, is to ask them, what do you think? A great example, I had a question from a parent several months ago. She said, my daughter is singing a song she heard that the babysitter had on in the car, and now she calls everything sexy, and it makes me terribly uncomfortable. What can I do about that? It's really the same question at the right developmental stage, is to say to our kids, what do you think about that? What does that word mean to you if the question is what's sexy? Or if what can you say, do you think that that's appropriate at that age? And you start to ask them. And maybe they think something's appropriate that you don't. Or maybe you're worried that they are just parroting back to you what you think they think you want to hear. But it's really an excellent opportunity for us to impart our values. Our kids are really listening. You know, I wanted to ask one more question of the parents that are here. Is there anybody that's had the experience of debating with their child about a movie or music or something like that? And, oh, this is perfect. Come, stand here, please. Um, I've had that debate with my daughter. She wanted to watch a movie called Role Models, and I okay. really wasn't paying attention. Um, however, I was in the same room, and all of a sudden I'm watching it. It has all this, it was rated R, and it was pretty pretty serious graphic? very is graphic <laughs> the term the terminology everything was very serious and i really had to sit down and go back and forth with my daughter on this as to you know i don't want you watching it i don't want her friends watching did you stop it. it in the middle i did stop it but it turns go. out she watched it with my mother <laughs> the week before <laughs> so it was kind of futile at that point but another thing, if you want to like look at the violence in the movies, even the young young movies, the G-rated movies, mm -hmm. I had the opportunity once to watch a movie in a different language, which I didn't speak or understand. So you're you really can't watching believe the images. how yeah. much violence is in a lot of these movies, and um, I think a lot of it's just you don't see it because of the words, the jokes, the funny meanings, and different things, double entendres, it's true. and things and like that. And we've learned that when when media content links humor with violence kids are even more likely to pick up those habits and to see violence as normative because it's funny. Yeah, I think it kind of desensitizes them in a way to, you know, things like That's that. That's true. Thank this you very much. This is your models. daughter? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, and, and it's such an important idea that even if our kids have seen something, to co-view with them and to watch with them and then discuss with them, that's kind of the price of wanting to watch these things that are more mature, but it can really help us pass on our values. There's actually a lot of good on TV too. And when we come back, Angela will introduce us to someone who has made it her mission to put quality children's programming on the air and can offer some great advice to parents. Want to find out more about IQ Smart Parent? Visit our website at wqed.org slash smartparent. There you'll find information about each episode, including topics and guests, links to the latest research on kids and media, and other great resources like books, videos, and articles on IQ Smart Parent topics. It's also your place to connect with our online community. Look for WQED EDU on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, and Pinterest for IQ Smart Parent updates and much more. For more than 50 years, WQED has helped spark your child's curiosity and love of learning with trusted resources in literacy, math and science, and social well-being. Now we're excited to launch a new institute for parents that will empower them with knowledge and resources to raise their 21st century children with confidence. Join our IQ Smart Parent community. Sign up at wqed.org slash smartparent. Super Why, my show on PBS Kids, is one that I was inspired to write because I was struck by the devastating statistics around reading. Two out of five children are poor readers in this country. And if you're a poor reader in first grade, there's a 90% chance you will remain a poor reader by the end of fourth grade. And then I found out that just 15 minutes of reading a day could equal one million new words a year. So I was sparked. Could I create a show that would make reading cool? That could show the adventures that are inside books beyond the words? That would empower kids and get them to learn and practice literacy skills? In order to do this, I knew that I needed the best. So I called on my good friend and one of the smartest people I know, Dr. Alice Wilder. 
Dr. Alice is a sought-after media professional who has worked on many Emmy and nominated programming called with Blues Clues, Super Y, and Speaker Booth. Hi, Dr. Hi. Alice. Hi, Angela. It's great so to be here. So excited for you to be here. Thank you. So we've been talking about a lot of the negative modeling and what we've been seeing, but we're here to talk about the silver lining, right? Right. Kids can learn from media. <laughs> right. It's actually really great to be here to talk about the positives of media. Um, because for us, we've always created, and it's all about the kids. So let's just talk about Blues Clues and Super Y for a little bit. We actually design our programming so that it will have a positive impact in kids' lives. And not just so that we can teach the thinking skills or letters or letter sounds that kids need to know, but also so that they can transfer those skills into their everyday life. So for example, one time I was in research and we were testing a show about shapes. And the kids got up from watching this episode and they looked around the room and they started to see shapes everywhere. And so they, um, this one little girl exclaimed, look, that light switch is a rectangle. And that's just the best when we can have that kind of impact. And that they master the concepts. We're so excited, but you know, we wish our teens could do that, right? Be excited by a rectangle. That would make <laughs> things a little easier. It does. It seems so simple and preschool to talk about this, uh, the positive impact. But I think I and we actually really believe that any creator of media can make it have a positive impact. And there's sort of two main uh, elements I see. One is intention. Mm -hmm. And the second is really knowing your audience. What are their needs? Who are they? And how can you elevate them as people? And that's what Dr. Alice does within, um, within a production. She has a formative research process so that we can actually get the feedback from kids and put it into, into our shows. Do you want to share a little bit about the secret sauce, but not, not too much? Don't tell them everything. I won't tell all the secrets. Just a little bit. <laughs> but we do, we test every episode of all of our shows uh, two to three times during the production. So as we're making it, we basically know what kids think. Um, so that we can feed that back into the process and make it really for them. So the three steps are what we call, the first step is the storyboarding process, where we take a second draft of an episode and we um, bring it into kids, I sit on the floor with them and play out the script. Then we come back into the, uh, the boardroom, the, um, the room where all the adults are, the director, the creator, and we basically make them feel as if they were sitting on the floor with the kids. So basically, Dr. Alice is Tom Hanks in that movie, Big. I don't know if you remember that movie. She represents that child who will then sit in the room and say, I don't get it. I don't <laughs> so actually, when I saw the movie Big, um, I was completely inspired by that. It actually completely changed my career. Um, I, I, has anyone seen that movie? Yeah. Okay. So when I saw that movie, I wanted to be Josh, who was played by Tom Hanks, who was really only 12 years old, but he was in the body of an adult. And when they were figuring out the next hottest toy for kids, everyone around the room was so excited about what this toy was going to be. And he looked at it and he said, what's so fun about that? And so from that point on, I really wanted to represent the kid point of view. And so for me, it was my mission became that the only way to understand kids, what appeals to them, what challenges them, what they learn from is to ask them. And so after the first part of the storybook research, you come back and we discuss, sometimes argue a little bit about <laughs> that bit. consequence in the second draft, the second stage. The second stage is an animatic. So we make a lot of changes mostly in the scripting phase. We make changes based on the kid, kids' responses and actually our own uh, educational philosophy. So um, if we want to make something that's a little bit more challenging, we might try it. So at the animatic stage, there's only so many more changes that can be made. Um, so we take it in, we show it to kids, we watch their eyes on screen, we figure out how much they're learning from it, what they're understanding, and hopefully the changes that we've made from the scripting phase are, are taken care of. Uh, at this phase, and, uh, and then we go from there. And the third stage and is the... And the third stage is the final content analysis. So it so has all the bells and whistles and everything is in the show at that point. Music is in everything. We actually cannot make any changes, but we test it so that any changes that we might want to make to subsequent episodes, 
we can make those recommendations and, and change things from there. So for us, what we do within the production process is try to direct the kids' learning. But you can do that every day as a parent. And so, for instance, you can make an Angry Birds educational. Yeah. Um, one time I was sitting next to a kid um, in a car, and he was playing Angry Birds, and I decided to just watch. And I started to tell him about uh, when, you're, when you have that little fulcrum thing, the little boomerang, um, I started to tell him about the force with which he was pulling on it or the angles that he was aiming it and talking about how, what the trajectory would be and how that would change based on his, what he did and how he angled and those sorts of physics, physics <laughs> concepts. And so after that, I said, okay, I'm gonna go back and do whatever it was I was doing. He goes, no, 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 don't leave. I really want you to stay here because I'm getting better at it. <laughs> this is really helping me and I'm learning from it. So I think that you can really make um, anything educational, you, can, uh, you just have to really direct the, their learning sometimes. Do you have other tips for us parents? Yeah, sure. I, I feel like um, a lot of them are, have already been said, but mastery is the, the key to, uh, rep repetition is the key to mastery. So, um, so the first one is really, do you see the values that your family, that your household upholds in the media that they're consuming? And the second is, what is the impact? What do you see your kids doing after they're consuming media? So as has already, already been mentioned, do you see your kids rolling their eyes or saying, oh man. The allergic reaction. The allergic reaction or, um, or sassy talking. Or do you find them looking for letters around their world? on a positive note and then wondering where did that come from and then the third is really to have a conversation it's really important not to underestimate whether don't don't think that your kids know what you think about the media that they're consuming what you like about it what you might not like about it and be sure to tell them why you can get into some really great conversations and even learn more about your child by understanding why they might like something or why might they might not and lastly, I just want to say that um, it really doesn't matter what they're being exposed to, either in media or in life. They're taking something away from the experience. So never forget that and always try to either direct those experiences or have conversations around everything. it. Everything's educational. It just depends on what you're learning. Yeah. yeah. So I, you know this, I was that preschooler who couldn't sit any closer to the TV when Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood was on and so Fred Rogers truly inspired me to go out and create shows that educate kids and I have to tell you I am so honored to be on the Mr. Rogers Neighborhood set and to be sitting here is completely to use a word that's over you surreal <laughs> um, but what Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood really is is a tribute to my mentor from afar who truly showed the world how to respect children and what quality children's media looks like I work with the Fred Rogers Company here in Pittsburgh, and what we do is we take Fred's 40 plus year pro-social curriculum, and we make little sticky signature songs that will help parents and kids with life's little lessons. It's the neighborhood of make-believe as it would look like today, animated, um, where all the characters have grown up and they all have preschoolers of their own. And Fred's first puppet, was Daniel Tiger, and he is the star of our show. So take a look at this. It is Daniel Tiger's neighborhood, a land of make believe. Won't you ride along with me? Ride along. It's Daniel Tiger's neighborhood, so much to do, so much to see. Won't you ride along with me? Ride along. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be my? Could you be my, won't you be my neighbor? So here's clue number two, if you're keeping track of Angela's clues. Talk with your kids. We, and wait, wait for them to answer you and to listen. We may know what the creator or writer wanted kids to get out of a television show or, or movie or media, but what did our kids really get? Ask them, wait for them to answer. And what you might find out is that while the show is about, let's say, anti-bullying, they spent, they might have spent 25 minutes on the bullying message, showing it and modeling it, and then five minutes resolving it. And guess what? Your kids learned more about being a bully than, than not. So we have a question from the audience. Hi. Hi, how are you? I'm good. What's your name? I'm Francesca. Hi, Francesca. 
Um, I was wondering, there's a big difference between children, how you were saying they get easily excited by a rectangle. Personally, I'm, I've seen it enough rectangles in my 16 years. <laughs> You're not excited about them no, anymore. No, not particularly. But um, currently, like my mother, she spoke earlier about role models. Movies like that, I do agree, sometimes they can be a bit much, but they're entertaining, and I feel like there's a certain t like limit where parents can be overbearing and not letting you like be free and kind of live your life but like you, there's also like a sense where they need to do something so this is kind of directed towards my mother how can <laughs> she um, <laughs> censor me without being as overbearing and let me have a little freedom well, what would you say? What would your answer be to that to your mom? My answer would be that I'm a wonderful child <laughs> and that she should trust me a little bit more and let me make my own decisions. I definitely still need guidance because, as she likes to say, my frontal lobe is not fully done growing <laughs> until I am 21. I so, <laughs> 25, excuse me. Um, <laughs> So I think she just needs to give me a little bit of freedom, but she needs to guide me, but she can take a step back. Mom, what do you think? You agree with that? I would absolutely. I definitely think it's a conversation, right, between families and your values and making those choices together. And I love the fact that you were watching together and talking about what concerns both of you. And how would you feel about having a conversation about the movie you just watched? It depends on how she approaches it. If she approaches it kind of awkwardly, then I'm just like, okay, mom, you can stop now. But then if she does it kind of more in a natural way, which I feel like the topics can be more natural, then that's how it is. I feel like obviously no one, like everyone knows this is good, this is bad. Like, because I see it on TV, it's not going to make me want to go and do it. I kind of have my own sense of judgment. Thank you. Here's the truth. Kids today don't just watch media. For this generation, they can create the media. They have access to devices and publishing tools and editing software at every turn. YouTube, Facebook, blogs, text, and music can all be kid-driven, and it empowers them. And a groundbreaking organization called Hip Hop Unlock lets kids create and tell their own stories through music. Let's take a look. Ime Alaquiva is an Emmy award-winning producer, entrepreneur, and mentor who is known for his strong presence in the music and radio industries and in the community. With him today is one of his students, Marna Owens. Hi, hey, so happy you're here. You that was awesome. Thank you. I mean, I these kids are video. doing some great work. So yes. awesome. And this is use of the media. Please, how did, this, how did this inspire you? How did you get started? What inspired Well, you? I got started, I mean, at the age of 13, I fell in love with hip hop, and hip hop spoke to me in a way that uh, nothing else, you know, ever spoke to me. Uh, became my mentor, my guider, uh, so to speak. And I always made the promise to try to change the world with what it is that I love, and that's music, and uh, particularly hip hop music. 
Um, so just, you know, with that background, creating Hip Hop on Lock in 2007, uh, has you know it's, it's changing the world now oh, I love it I always say that changing yes. the world one preschool show at a time of course I know. It's <laughs> awesome what a bow. I know yes. um, <laughs> and how has this sparked you it's definitely inspired me to be bigger and better than I ever knew I could be he has definitely helped me and mentored me and guided me in different ways than I could ever imagine like we were talking earlier I never thought I would be <laughs> doing things like this and it just inspires me and it makes me want to inspire other people and other youth my age. Absolutely. So can you tell us yes. what Hip Hop Unlock means? Hip Hop Unlock, um, L-O-C-K stands for Leadership Development, Organizational Skills, Cooperative Economics, and Knowledge of the Music Business. Uh, Hip Hop Unlock is a, an award-winning arts education and mentoring program that employs hip hop as a tool to educate and empower youth kindergarten to 12th grade uh, mm -hmm. by using you know, lots of tools, uh, video production, radio production as well, graphic design, photography, and really giving these kids the tools that it takes to build foundations that will change their lives forever. And I love that, and that's yeah. huge. How do you believe that the knowledge of the music business actually affects their math and literacy and science skills? Well, basically what we do is we find creative and innovative ways to teach our young people uh, by using hip hop as the umbrella. And what we do is we teach math, literacy, and science uh, under the umbrella of hip hop by doing very simple things, simple workshops like, you know, uh, how do we come up with creative lyrics um, that actually mean something and not lyrics that, you know, uh, you know, are very, very derogative in, in a way. You know, how do we use positive lyrics? How do we use um, the scientific breakdown of what's um, called auto-tune, which T-Pain, who's a rapper who uses his on his voice, but little do you know, it, uh, what it does is it uh, changes the algorithms in your voice f uh, from binary codes of zeros and ones. So you're demystifying so, it. Yes. Yeah, so how do we it? break that scientific, uh, uh, you know, uh, operation down? Right. Um, you know, when Rapper's Delight came out in 1979, who was the president of the United States? You know what I mean? So really connecting new, creative, innovative mm -hmm. ways that kids learn without them even knowing that they're learning and having so much fun doing it. Oh, I love that. And I yes. believe, too, that music, if you sing anything to kids, they'll learn it. Think yeah. about it. Your shows work because of, you know, music. a lot of music and mm -hmm. things of that nature. Just imagine if we had, uh, you know, one of your characters rapping, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yes, y'all. You know what I mean? Yeah. So um, it's, it's, uh, it's very engaging and very interactive. And you do that even with your five-year-olds, right? You're in, you're Absolutely. I mean, there might be a, a, a situation where there might be a five-year-old who is difficult, like having a difficult time remembering his ABCs. If we put it in a way where it's like, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, what, what, you know, it becomes this cool thing. You know what I mean? Catchy, I got it. It becomes this cool thing that next thing you know, two weeks later, he's trying to teach you, he or she's trying to teach you sure. your ABCs. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, I love it. So um, that is, um, you know, 2013, we have to find ways to, uh, to allow ourselves to be cool as, as adults and, and be accepted by these young people. I love it. Yeah. And how old were you when you started working or participating in the program? I was actually 13. Oh, wow. Yes. That's wonderful. And what do you do today? What's your what's your focus? Wow, today I am a radio host, but not only do I, I do radio hosts, I do operations management mm -hmm. and I do PR work and it has definitely broadened my horizons. I've definitely been able to keep my hands on a lot of stuff and definitely train myself and train other people how to do it. Mm. We're going to all be working for you. Powerful. Yes. <laughs> Very powerful. You, uh, yes. And mm -hmm. you're writing. Do you, you write as well? I do not write. I actually do radio right now. So I talk to other people. I meet CEOs. I meet young and upcoming rappers in Pittsburgh. And just hopefully, not only is it making an impression on me, it's making an impression on somebody else that's listening. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We have an audience question. Hi. I have a question for you. Um, how do you use hip hop in order to develop character traits that we want to build in our children and what do you do in terms of uh, dealing with the negative messages that are already out there in music in general mm -hmm. that the kids are going to listen to along with what they're already creating? Very good question. The L in LOCK stands for Leadership Development. The premise of our program is we partner with a community organization outside um, uh, and we create cohorts of seven to ten students where they come together and it's almost like the apprentice meets making it a band. <laughs> So these kids are given executive positions just like in a mock record label. 
and they execute, they learn how to mix, master, arrange, uh, participate and you know a lot of technological uh, equipment and things of that nature to produce a music CD from conception to completion. Throughout this they use um, uh, video equipment where they learn how to you know uh, create their own music video or their own music documentary. We have what's called a throwback which is often associated with a song um, that your mom and dad used to listen to but in Hip Hop Unlocked it's um, uh, an exercise where we throw back our talent in the form of community service. What does that look like? Yes, well what, what that does is uh, these students come together just in a board meeting and they figure out how can I throw back my talent in the form of uh, you know collecting cell phones for individuals, how do we feed the homeless and things of that nature and essentially learn what it is to build their community and not just build songs and build music but how do we change the world from the inside out you know, and that's what we do uh, uh, through the, the power of hip hop. Um, and how we deal with the negative, uh, 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 you know, connotations in a lot of music and television is that the music CD that they create, they have to actually make it a positive, um, uh, you know, it has to be a positive outcome. Whether that's, you know, uh, building your community, how it is to become uh, from a boy to a man, um, fatherhood, excuse me, motherhood and things of that nature. Um, so they have a tangible CD that they can share with the community that not only changes their lives, but it changes the, the, the lives of the individuals that are in the community. No curse words, none of that negativity. Marna, do you have a story in terms of this type of um, CD coming together, a music video or something that you've worked on? Well, it's great. I don't get to work on it myself, but it's great watching other people work on theirs and seeing them develop because they develop personally. When you give a kid, it's like my favorite saying is, what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? So in this, they're given the position where they are able to freely express themselves and they can't fail. And so therefore it builds their self-esteem and it builds them and watching them grow and then giving them an extreme CD release party at the end and seeing that they're so proud of themselves and not only are they proud of themselves, but the community is proud of them because they have definitely reached out and done what they had to do. Oh, that's Absolutely. awesome. I'm proud of you. Yes. We have another audience question. Hi. Yeah. Hi. My daughter's only um, two and a half, but I write a blog and one of the hot topics right now for a lot of my readers is how do they use media and music to stimulate their kids during the summertime because there's this great brain drain that people talk about and not everybody's fortunate enough to be in Hip Hop Unlocked. So any suggestions for other parents about how to keep their kids motivated in the summer using things that they're already interested in? Yeah, that's my question too. Absolutely. Um, there are a lot of programs uh, that are out in the communities where you can really in, um, allow your students to really engage in dealing with media. Um, there, uh, a lot of the uh, Carnegie Music Libraries actually have workshops uh, that teach media literacy uh, for all ages. Um, so I think it's just, it's really just mobilizing and sort of getting um, out into the community and learning how that can sort of benefit your household um, as well. Hip Hop on Lock is, is currently in all the Carnegie Libraries um, in, in Pittsburgh right now. Um, and we also have, uh, you know, after school programs from, for, you know, kids as, as, as young as four and five years old. So uh, as a parent, definitely getting out there more and realizing how, you know, um, the resources that your community has. So you're mm -hmm. affecting kids' lives every single day. What, how does that feel and what's, what's well, your favorite memory? Um, one, of, one of my uh, uh, favorite sayings is teamwork makes the dream work. Um, you know, when you think that you can do any, everything by yourself is the time you'll end up by yourself. So I try to surround myself around so many individuals, um, you know, from all walks of life uh, in, in order to help me to build the character that I need to change uh, other individuals' lives so through hip hop. I mean, we started um, serving only 16 students our first year to now over 5,000 throughout back, Western Pennsylvania, and North Carolina, and New York City. Uh, and we plan to expand more. Hip hop, you don't stop. <laughs> I love that. Yes, That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> So great. So can you um, have one memory that you might have of one child or one story that you can share? Well, one story that I, I can share is of a, a boy who was having a very difficult time, of course, learning his, his ABCs. Uh, the, the teachers gave up on him. Uh, they said, oh, you, he has ADD, he has hypertension, there's a lot of different things. Uh, he may 
uh, a, you as a young African-American male, how can you sort of identify and connect with this young uh, African-American child uh, who was a boy? And, you know, I sat with him, and just like you said, you know, sitting with a, a, a kid, you know, for a certain amount of time a day um, really, you know, uh, comes to, you know, have lots of benefits. So I sat down with this kid probably for one week, and we came up with a, a, a nice little rap and uh, he learned his ABCs in a matter of two weeks when there were, there were teachers who just completely gave up on him. So it shows the power of being creative. Uh, and being where they're you know, at, right? Being where they're at and also creating that relationship. Right. You know what I mean? Um, you know, because relationships are, 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 are like bank accounts. You got to make deposits in those. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so I was making a deposit in, in the relationship and creating that interpersonal connection with that, that young African-American boy. And today, yeah. I mean, he's, he's one of, uh, you know, our great success stories. Oh, my God. Can't you do this all types of music and everything? We need all these positive pretty lyrics. So, pretty and all soon. This hey, we might I have love it. rock everything, on lock. Right? We Why might not? have <laughs> classical Start on lock, right spoken word on lock. Absolutely. Yes. Are you going to rap a little for us? Well, or? I mean, I, I'm thinking you could rap oh, a yeah. little bit. No, first, no, first let, let, let's give her uh, a name. We rap what? every week. MC yeah, Angie so let's Ange. Go. MC Angie Ange. I agree. <laughs> All right, can we give it up for MC Angie yeah. Ange? <laughs> okay, so I'm going, to, I'm going to beatbox. All you have to do is just rhyme two words together. Oh, jeez. Yes, here we go. Uh, can we just do a snap? Uh -huh. I can do that mm -hmm. part. <laughs> uh, all right, we're going to rap. Oh, no. right, can you do go. it with me? Yeah. Here we go. You want to start it off? I can't even stop with you. My name is Marna, and I like to talk to Miss Ange. <laughs> All right, I have to rhyme uh, that. Or sure, yeah, Ange, right. here we go. All right, my name is Angela, and I'm here to say I hope you enjoyed the show today. Oh! Oh, is that good? No. Oh, oh, I'm going to stick to what I do. Yes. You stick to what you do. And your Grammy Award is in the mail right now. Yeah, okay. Yes. <laughs> I think we have another question. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that part of the appeal of, of hip hop and, and rock and roll and is, is sort of the, the rebelliousness and the taboo aspects of it. So do you find that, that some of the kids just, just um, basically, basically you're ruining hip hop for them? Oh. <laughs> do you know what I mean? That, that, that they like it because it's negative. Well, here's the thing. What we do is when these cohorts come in, we put up a whiteboard and we throw subject matter. You know, blurt out any word or any you know, uh, phrase or whatever the case is. When we throw these things on a whiteboard and when you engage these students and these young people into something so powerful, they totally forget what's on MTV, VH1 and MTV. Think about the relationship that you have to uh, establish first where the creatively it becomes cool to stay in school. You understand what I'm saying? Because this is something that they're creating from conception to completion. You can never take this experience away from these kids. And it works, you know, it used to be called Hip Hop Unlock Project, but it's no longer called Project because it works. And, you know, it's currently being used in Propel schools, even to, you know, uh, your most prestigious uh, private schools, you know, being used as, as English electives. You know what I mean? So, you know, you can turn on the MTV and you can feed your brain with that, but how do we really make a strong impact in these young people's lives by using hip hop? You totally have. Thank Let's you do it. so much. Thank you so much for having us. We appreciate Thank it. Thank you. So yeah. it's time for my third clue. Here's clue number three. Give kids the power to make their own media. Be creative and interactive, whether it's by giving kids a camera or a microphone or guitar, even just oatmeal boxes as drums. You can give them a pencil to write their feelings into song lyrics. Getting kids actively involved with media ensures that they are learning. Making media truly gives them their own voice. All media, music, movies, television, present challenges and opportunities. We hope parents think of our advice and feel empowered to tune in to what kids are watching, interact with kids, talk with them, and empower them to create their own stories and not be driven by the ones with messages about sex and violence and alcohol. Media can be a touchstone for families to bond together. Media can help you explore topics that you might want to avoid. And media can teach, media can empower, media can inspire. 
Here are some last tips from Common Sense Media. Make the right choices. Be an informed consumer. Tune in to what they're watching. Find teachable moments. Dr. G, do you have any final thoughts? I do. We're not always going to make those right choices, even though that is always my goal as a parent. So involve your kids in the conversation about what we're aiming for and hold them accountable. If there's something that they really want to watch, ask why. If you're willing, watch it with them, screen it beforehand. But if you really feel like you need to hold a line, then say to your kids, I want you to be a part of this conversation, so you have to hold yourself accountable to our family's values. And if there's something you want from media and I can't find a way for you to get it in a way that I think is safe for you as a person, then create that media. You go out and you, with your friends, work together to create that positive message that we just heard about that has the elements that you want that you feel like adults aren't giving you in a way that's acceptable for kids your age. That's great. All right, so everyone has their handy dandy notebooks out, right? Because these are my, my final clues. Clue number one, if there's anything you take away from this, these are the clues. Clue number one, when you can, watch with your kids or read a review or talk about the media and give kids, basically what we want to know is we want to know what they're watching and we want to give kids the power to interact or create their own media. When we talk to our kids, which is clue number two, we want to pause and we want to wait for them to answer us back because we really want to get them involved in everything that we're talking about so that they know our values. You can also visit us at www.wqed.org slash smartparent for additional information on this topic or share your experience and personal stories on our social media outlets. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of IQ Smart Parent. Thanks for watching.